So now all we've got to do is get the trans off the trans jack, get it out from under the car. That didn't work worth the fucking shit. Hey guys, good morning. Today on Vintage Speed Garage, we're going to be working on our 66 Mustang project. Uh, it's a 289 C4 car, automatic transmission, convertible, California car. And uh, we've been working on the new long block, trying to get it prepared to drop back in to the 66. Um, and I, unfortunately, I've uh, been inspecting some of the parts here that we're going to reuse on the new long block. Uh, the long block came with everything uh, up to the cylinder heads, basically, uh, but it didn't come with any of the covers um, that you would normally reuse from your original motor. So I was cleaning up the timing cover in the solvent tank uh, using diesel fuel, and uh, noticed that we had more, found more corrosion damage here. Um, one of our water jackets uh, that goes from the water pump through the engine block is so badly corroded that it has actually eroded uh, the port into one of the bolts that holds the water pump in place. So we can't use that. Um, I mean a lot of guys might try and silicone that bolt up real good and that might be a temporary fix but um, in our case we don't want temporary fixes. We want permanent fixes. We want something uh, that uh, the owner of the car will be able to drive long distance and not have to worry about overheating, water leaks, oil leaks, etc. The timing cover on a V8 is important because it uh, contains your front timing set, which is your uh, timing chain, the crankshaft gear, and the camshaft gear that rotate the chain, um, as well as the fuel pump eccentric on the front of the camshaft. Um, all of that's contained here inside the timing cover. And these front four bolts here actually fit down into the front of the oil pan and seal the front half of the oil pan uh, from, the, from the rest of the engine block. So I've got a new timing cover on order, and that should be in here next week, but that has pushed me back on uh, getting this motor drop back in. So we are going to work on something else today. Today we're going to drop the transmission, get that out so we can replace the input shaft, output shaft seal, and pilot shaft bushing. Uh, we're also going to install new U-joints on the rear drive line and uh, get it up in the air, get on jack stands, and see what other kind of trouble we can get into on this project today. So you guys sit back, relax, enjoy a cold beverage while I bang my knuckles here and I'm going to get to work. Okay guys, so before I go much further here, on the Mustang, removing the wheels and getting everything ready to uh, start tearing down, uh, getting the rear drive line out, get the transmission out. I wanted to show you what I found here when I uh, pulled a few of these lug nuts off these wheels. These wheels are true hub centric wheels, and I'm going to show you what that means because there's a lot of confusion out there over the term lug centric and hub centric, and people don't really understand what the differences are. They think everything's hub centric, and they're not. Um, so these wheels are truly hub centric. I'm going to show you why and how you can tell that and what the difference is between a hub centric and a lug centric wheel. Okay, so here we have the front driver side wheel on our Mustang, our 66 Mustang project here. And when I started pulling lug nuts, I realized what I was looking at here and I wanted to show you guys so that you would understand what the difference is here. This is a this is a hub centric wheel. Now the way you can tell that is, you see how these lug nut holes are slotted, okay? That's so that the, this wheel can be used on a couple different bolt patterns, right? Probably Ford and Chevy uh, of the time. These wheels were probably manufactured sometime in the 80s, is my guess. Maybe, uh, yeah, probably 80s, mid-80s. So a lot of wheels during that time were hub-centric. And the way you can tell that is you'll notice there is no taper here for the lug nut. This is completely flat where the lug nut sits. The lug nut itself basically has a flat washer and a bore. There's no taper at all to this lug nut. Okay, so there's nothing to keep this wheel centered when you throw this wheel on. There's nothing to center up the wheel except for the center of the hub. Okay, so this centerpiece here, which probably had a really cool spinner back in the 80s on it, this uh, 
this hub centers this wheel on this lug pattern, okay? With a flat mounting surface on the wheel like this, there's no way to keep that wheel centered other than the hub center. And if you take this center out of this wheel, which they just pop out like any center cap does, if you take this center cap out of the wheel, then there's nothing to keep that wheel centered. So you could bolt it down on these flat surfaces with these flat lug nuts, just a little off center, and your wheel will thump and move up and down and not be centric. Now conversely, a lug centric wheel, which is what the majority of wheels are these days, despite what people will tell you, a lug centric wheel has a tapered cone lug nut and a tapered matching bore on the wheel. So when you tighten the lug nut that's tapered as a cone shape into the cone shape bore on the wheel, that's what centers the wheel up. There's no way the wheel can move side to side and be out of true, okay, because those cones locked into the bottom of those lug nuts in the bore of those wheels prevent that wheel from moving anywhere. The wheel is centered on the lug nuts and it's lug centric. The center bore doesn't matter. It could be completely non-existent. There doesn't need to be a center bore at all on a, on a lug centric wheel. And that's what the majority of wheels are these days is lug centric. And that is the difference between a hub centered or hub centric wheel like what's on our Mustang here and a lug centric wheel like probably what's on your car. Okay guys, so continuing on my theme of bad modifications from the 70s and 80s here on our Mustang project, I'm going to show you one other item that you may not have ever seen before that used to be pretty popular back in the day, uh, and that is coil spring spacers. So these things are like a, a knuckle that fits between the springs and you rotate it with a, with a ratchet and it locks into the springs and it adds height to the springs. Horrible idea. It'll kink your springs and cause damage to the springs, which I'll show you here in a close-up. Um, we have some evident, probably bent springs here on the front of our Mustang from using these things. You know, this car was last registered in 1989, so it's kind of like a time capsule of the 80s and the 70s. And uh, much like the hub-centric flat mounting wheels and lug nuts that I showed you here that came off of our project with the with the dual bolt pattern slots in them. Um, this is another don't do modification that was done in the 70s and 80s quite common. Alright, so if we look here up at our front coil springs on the front passenger side of our Mustang, you'll see what I'm talking about. And this is the coil spring spacer that I'm referring to. It's basically an oblong or like a, you could look at it like kind of an egg shaped device that can fit in between the springs and then when rotated it spreads the, the coil spring out and gives you a little extra height in the front um, suspension. But you can see here the coil spring is actually bent around the top of this thing and most likely here at the bottom too. It's just probably hard to tell. Um, but this is wedged in here in between two of our coils on our front coil springs and has probably ruined these coils. Uh, I'm not going to know until I take the shock out, get the coil spring out and look at it a little closer if we can continue to use these or not. I'm not sure why they were put in here, you know, maybe a clearer larger wheels or just to bring the front of the car up, uh, but for whatever reason it's the wrong way to do it. Uh, but whatever the reason it's the wrong way to do it and we're going to pull these out right now. Hopefully they don't go flying across the shop and hit me in the face, but uh, I'm going to pop these out right now and, and we'll see what uh, what happens. I've got a horrible mismatch of extensions and adapters here because I broke my uh, I broke my half inch extension. I haven't replaced it yet. Half to three eighths from three eighths to half. I know wrong way to do it, but I got to get it done. Yeah, that's a little unnerving. So here's uh, it's just a little cast aluminum deal. It's kind of got a corkscrew on one end so you can stick it between your coil springs and spread them out all the way up to like that position. And you just stick it in there and rotate it up till it locks into place against your coils and bends your coils all to hell and ruins them. So obviously we're not going to be running these. Okay guys, so we're underneath the Mustang here, or the Rustang. And uh, 
we're going to pull out the rear drive shaft. The rear drive shaft is connected here at the input yoke on the rear axle. The U joints are held in place with a couple of U bolts here, these U shaped bolts that go into the yoke. Got to take these four nuts off and that'll loosen up the uh, and that'll take the U-joint loose from the yoke. We can pry the U-joint forward a little bit, drop the uh, drop the drive line out of it. In the front of our drive shaft here, uh, we're connected to the output of the transmission. Uh, this is the tail housing on the transmission. The output shaft is uh, inside here underneath the slip yoke. And uh, much like the rear yoke on the rear of the drive shaft, this is the front yoke on the front of the drive shaft, and this yoke is a slip yoke. It, it slips in and out of the transmission, riding against this seal here. And uh, that allows, when the rear axle moves up and down, that allows the drive shaft to slip forward and back inside this seal, inside the transmission here, so that uh, if it was fixed in place and it didn't have a slip, uh, the U-joints would bind up and break. Okay guys, so we got the C4 here out of the Mustang, and uh, training looks in pretty good shape. Looks like it's been rebuilt at some point before, so that's good. Uh, uh, I would feel confident in the seals, except I've had to take it apart, so um, I think we're going to replace the seals. They're potentially 30 years old, and uh, just to make sure we don't have any leaks going on, we're going to replace the input shaft seal, and we're going to replace the output or the tail housing seal as well. So in addition to our seals here, I've got a, uh, I've got a big socket here. This is a four-wheel drive socket for a front Dana 60. And it happens to be just the right size to fit around our seals and be able to punch our seals into place in the transmission. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and use that to drive these seals in. I've got some Loctite for the... Uh, okay, so our C4 here has a removable bell housing. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and take the bell off here so I can get to that front seal on the input shaft. And when I put these bill housing bolts back in, uh, I'll be sure to lock tight them. Well, I don't think uh, with six bolts in there that the bell housing is going to fall off. You definitely don't want any of those bolts to vibrate loose and get stuck in between the flex plate and the side of the bell housing or jammed up into your starter, so it'll snap your bell housing and crack it. Cause you all kinds of problems. So now I'm just very carefully going to work my way around the seal and pull the seal out of here. And you can see this seal looks good, but uh, it's still fairly flexible. But after 30 years of sitting, I didn't want to take a chance and run the old seal, so we're going to put a new one in there. Same with the uh, output shaft, so we'll pull that one next here. And this is the improved output shaft seal that they uh, give you as a replacement for this style. So you can see it's got a much lo longer dust seal on it, dust boot. Uh, same seal otherwise, internally it's still got the same lip on it, same seal. But uh, they increased the length of the dust boot to keep, uh, keep dirt on your drive shaft from slipping past the standard seal. And these do have a drain hole. So you need to make sure that drain hole at the bottom of it is pointed down so that any water that gets trapped in here from the drive shaft will be able to drain out that drain hole. You'll know the seal is seated all the way when you get that good sharp ping out of the hammer. Uh, that means that it's solid. You're making good solid contact with the uh, 
body of the transmission and you know your seal is seated all the way in its land. So now that we've got our seals in, before I throw the bell housing back on, I'm going to flip it over and change out the transmission filter just because it's easy to get to here. And that way when I throw this back on the back of our long block here and get ready to stab this all in as one component, um, I won't have to climb back under there and uh, redo the, the uh, oil filter and the trans pans. Okay guys, so that's pretty much going to wrap it up for today, actually for this week, on our 66 Mustang project. I've worked on it over multiple days. I had a lot of work going on, so in between I was able to get a little bit of work done here on the Mustang during the day. And So we got some, uh, we got some parts in for our Mustang. Today we went through and changed out the seals on our transmission, uh, changed out the tranny filter on the transmission. I've got a few more things to do on the tranny here before I can bolt it on the back of the motor. I've got to close up the motor. Get all that bolted back together and we can slam that whole assembly in as one piece so we're making good progress which currently has points in it points in a condenser uh, we're not going to be using the points in con condenser we've got a uh, nice pertronics electronic ignition that's going to replace all those components um, pertronics is great those eis are super reliable i've never had a problem with any of those pertronics ignitions i've run them in lots of hot street cars and uh, they work great so I also got the timing cover. I had to replace the timing cover on our uh, small block here because the timing cover we had was cracked. Uh, it had eroded between the, uh, the water jacket here from the water pump and one of the studs on the timing cover. And it had, it had cracked basically and eroded from all that corrosion that was in the cooling system in between here. And it was just to the point where I might have been able to goop up that bolt with some silicone goop up the gasket real heavy and bolt it together but I'm not going to take that kind of chance on our motor. We have a nice brand new motor here and uh, this isn't my car it's a family member's car and I'm not going to take any kind of chances with that. I also got something for the 73 OBS here. I got uh, the restricted oil line that is necessary to limit the amount of oil going into our turbo. Currently I have a, a big piece of 3 8 inch fuel line that I had and a couple hose barbs uh, that are way too big for the turbo and what, what you're seeing in some of the videos of my truck is uh, under boost it's blowing oil out the tailpipe. You're seeing smoke out the tailpipe and a lot of blow by um, out the vent tube, the, uh, the draft tube that's venting the crankcase pressure and the crankcase ventilation tube basically. Um, a lot of that is because of the oversized oil line that is currently lubricating our turbo. The uh, this line is about an eighth inch diameter internal ID. The line that's on there is a three eighths inch internal bore. So what's happening is we're getting too much oil flow into the turbo. Oil pressure is forcing all that extra oil out the bearings and we're getting a lot of, uh, a lot of oil onto both sides of the turbo. On the exhaust side in the turbine housing that's blowing out the uh, tailpipe as smoke and we're getting it into the intake side of the turbo as well. Uh, on the compressor side that's you know mucking everything up and causing a lot of leaking past the uh, rings and blow by. So for me guys that's it for today. Thank you for watching another video here at the Vintage Speed Garage. Please if you think I did a halfway decent job on the video give me a like, uh, subscribe if you're new and uh, thank you for watching.